Hey, welcome back to The Dive. Joining us today is a serially successful founder that is highly involved in uranium. He will share his thoughts on the uranium price movement, nuclear power's impact on energy prices, countries he sees that will make significant contributions to the market, the company's projects, and key events investors should be looking out for. He is the president, CEO, director, and co-founder of Uranium Energy Corp. Amir Adnani is joining us today. But before we bring Amir on, just a quick reminder to tap on that subscribe button for me, please. Hey, Amir, welcome to The Dive. Hey, Cassandra, nice to connect with you guys. First time. Yeah, it's so great to have you. Okay, so let's start with all the movement in uranium pricing. We have seen a surge in demand from retail investors in uranium again, in large part thanks to the Sprott Physical Trust. How big of an impact do you think retail investors can have on the spot price of uranium? Well, we finally have a mechanism in the Sprott Uranium Trust that really allows investors, retail or institution, to express a very direct form of investment in the spot physical market. The spot physical market for uranium has historically always been opaque and illiquid. By introducing a player, which is the Sprott Uranium Trust, that on a day-to-day -day basis will deploy capital when it trades at certain levels and when the trust's mandate is to never sit on cash. If they raise cash, they're buying physical uranium with that. We all of a sudden have price discovery in what was otherwise for decades, and as I mentioned, an illiquid market. And now what we're realizing is that um, there's not a lot of float available in the physical uranium market. Just the fact that Sprott has launched their uh, initiative, which is uh, up to $1.3 billion under this uh, kind of first phase of a at the market equity program that they've launched. They've deployed so far roughly $400 million of the 1.3 billion. And that's already moved the uranium price by 45%. That's a lot. I mean, it's not a lot of money for that kind of percentage move. That would never happen in the gold market. If someone showed up tomorrow looking to buy $400 million of physical gold, it, it, it wouldn't move the gold price by 40 or 45%. And so mm -hmm. I think what it does in a way is, you know, it reminds me, Cassandra, of the, the grayscale Bitcoin trust when that was launched a few years back and how it created that buyer, that institutional buyer in the market on a daily basis that started soaking up the float that was available. And it, it was the trigger for this incredible run we saw in Bitcoin. Now, I think this run in uranium would be far more fundamental because uranium is actually a commodity that gets used up. So people aren't just buying it as an investment. There are utilities in this equation that buy uranium and consume it to generate electricity. And so it's a very fascinating setup that we now have a whole new uh, category of investors who are buying and holding physical uranium through this broad physical uranium trust. Yet there's a whole world of reactors, 440 reactors in the world that year in and year out need to consume uranium as their fuel to keep operating and generating uh, clean emission-free electricity. Mm -hmm. So do you have any sense of the impact that energy prices in Europe will have on the demand for uranium? And do you think this could increase the desire for nuclear power in the long term? Absolutely, because the reality is we've always talked about this issue. I mean, first of all, if we go back to the 1980s when we had the, the, the oil shock of the 80s uh, and sorry, the late 70s, it was a catalyst for the country of France to say, you know what, we want to be in control of our own energy and we want to have more energy security. They proceeded to build enough nuclear reactors where 70% of France's electricity needs are met domestically with reactors that sit on their own soil and provide them with base load power. Uh, you look at energy security and supply chains. Anytime you're dependent on a supply chain, in this case, in this case gas that comes from Russia or somewhere else in the world, you're at the mercy of supply chain risk and you're at the mercy of supply chain disruptions. With nuclear power, you have reactors that sit on your own soil, in your own backyard. They can generate electricity uh, around the clock with very little fuel requirement and, re and reload requirement. Once a reactor has been loaded with fuel, it can operate continuously for 12 to 18 months. That is 
what we call base load capacity that nuclear power has. That's why they say nuclear can be the backbone of an energy uh, matrix. So I think what's happening in Europe uh, for end users is unfortunate. It's it's difficult and sad to see these lineups and these crazy situation that the end user and the consumer is dealing with at the gas stations or with now the concern of winter coming and whether there's going to be enough available and 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 reliable and cheap source of power available as we go into uh, the winter uh, uh, months and season. But the reality is this is what underscores the importance of A, having a diversified energy mix where you don't have all your eggs in one basket with hydrocarbons or with gas and or one supplier, i.e. Russia, and why nuclear power can be such an important part of providing energy security for any country. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So what countries do you think could add significant nuclear power projects over the next 10 years? Well, look at the U.S. The U.S. is an interesting case because you have the development of advanced modular reactors led by individuals like Bill Gates, who has founded a company called Terra Power. And he is actually now uh, building a, the, one of the first of its kind small modular reactors in the state of Wyoming on the site of where there used to be an operating coal-fired plant. And these small modular reactors are a very promising area for uh, reactors where, you know, instead of being a large one gigawatt reactor, these are typically 100 megawatt reactors, uh, faster to build, lower capital requirements, and you don't need to build them near very densely populated cities, which is historically where reactors have been built. You can build them in sparsely populated areas. State of Wyoming is a big state, but it's a sparsely populated state. Yet Bill Gates is investing capital and, and, and going there. You see reactors on the construction in China such that China as one of the most important growth markets for nuclear power by 2030, the end of this decade, will surpass the US at, and being the largest uh, country when it comes to nuclear generation. The growth in China is remarkable and there, it really is an important driver. There's over 50 reactors on the construction as we speak right now uh, in United Arab Emirates, in China, in Russia, in South Korea. And again, with the advanced modular reactors in countries like the US. So we're seeing different forms of growth, but certainly China, I think, would be a very important driver of growth uh, in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so how many of the long-term contracts with utility companies are up for renewal over the near term? And what's the typical length of these contracts? The last time we saw a major contracting cycle was 2010. Since then, the market was in a decade-long bear market. Utilities were not contracting, and they were really just benefiting from the very low uranium price and oversupply of uranium in the market around $20, $25 per pound. That's below the marginal cost of production for producers. Marginal cost of production is around $45 per pound. And so that's why over the last few years, we saw supply curtailment, mines being closed. And now we end up in this new position where supply of uranium uh, for the last five years has been far less than where demand is. And as a result, we're seeing a move in uranium prices. It's not just fraud buying physical uranium. It's the fact that we consume more uranium on an annual basis than we produce. Demand is going to approach 200 million pounds per year, while demand is less than 130 million pounds per year. We're running a 60 million pound per year deficit between su primary supply from production and demand. So that is actually the big story. The big story is the structural deficit between supply and demand, not mm -hmm. so much the, the, what Sprott is doing. Sprott is really accelerating price discovery in a market that had been rebalanced already. Now, Coming forward to your question about contracting, we are starting to see the early signs of uh, utilities entering the market, looking at contract. There was a Korean utility in the market recently. There was a US utility in the market this past week, looking to uh, uh, lock in some uranium supplies for long-term deliveries. Typically, utilities will sign contracts anywhere up to three to maybe 10 years. They are such a predictable buyer of uranium because if you react operate for the next 20 to 40 years, you want to lock in as much of your future uranium needs as possible to have security of supply for your reactor. Existing reactors that are operating, for them, uranium makes up a very small percentage of their overall cost. What you don't want to have is the supply basis where you run out of uranium. So 
Typical contracts, again, could be multi-years that you could see fixed price deliveries. You could see blending price uh, uh, made up in the deliveries. And, and, and all of that is kind of customized and fairly bespoke. Uh, and really, the next contracting cycle, which we're in the early days of, I think is going to be even a bigger driver of uranium prices and creating pressure on the market than even what the Sprott Physical Trust is doing. Okay, wow. Okay, so let's talk about Uranium Energy Corp. What's the high-level strategy for the company? We're the premier U.S. uranium mining company. We're, our whole focus for 17 years has been recognizing that the U.S. is the largest market for uranium consumption in the world. There are more reactors operating in the U.S. today than any other country, over 90 operable reactors. One in every five home in America is powered by nuclear energy. Yet there is today no uranium mining domestically in the U.S. We talked about supply chains. We talked about what's happening in Europe. We talked about the importance of having the vital commodities and fuels that you need to run reactors available. The U.S. utilities are completely exposed. With no domestic production, they're 100% dependent on foreign imports. And that's an issue that policymakers see as a vulnerability. That's why the U.S. government has created what's, for the first time in really decades, since the 1950s, we haven't seen a program like this, where the U.S. government will start to buy and store uranium to build a national stockpile, make sure there's strategic supplies available. This U.S. uranium reserve will start uh, later this year, will run for 10 years. They will only buy uranium from domestic sources. My company, Uranium Energy, is a past producer of uranium in the U.S. We have a mine that we produced uranium from in South Texas, our Palangana mine. In the, as, as a company, we have that proof of concept. We have the validation that we mined uranium. We're ready to restart that mine. And over the last decade, when the uranium prices were too low for us to produce and sell uranium with a profit, we shut the mine down and we became a very aggressive developer. We tripled the size of our resource base. We quadrupled the size of our permitted capacity for production. And so today, what really sets Uranium Energy Corp apart is that we are permitted and ready to go to production. Majority of projects in the world today have not been fully permitted. You need to have both the regulatory license and social license to start producing uranium. That takes time. We've invested the time because we've been consistently in this business for 17 years. We mined uranium that gives us a credibility that 99% of juniors don't have. And we have now created the critical mass where we have 100 million pounds of uranium in the ground. 50% of our resource base is fully permitted using the low cost institute recovery method that we're focused on in Texas and Wyoming, the two most productive states for uranium mining in the US. And we have a team with credibility from Washington, D.C. to operating mines. Uh, the chairman of our company is the former United States Energy Secretary, Spencer Abraham. Our technical team are individuals that have built and operated uranium mines throughout Texas and Wyoming. The current president of the Uranium Producers of America is the executive VP of our company. We're New York Stock Exchange listed. And we have a balance sheet to back everything up that I'm talking about. We have over $110 million in cash physical uranium, and uranium-related equity holdings. So not only did we think the bear market in uranium was a good time to buy projects on the cheap, but physical uranium was also cheap. We were buying physical uranium and storing it when it was less than $30 per pound, believing that it was a great investment and a balance sheet asset, and it's worked out. That investment is up over 40% since we started our physical uranium uh, initiative. Wow, that's great. So what criteria do you use to choose which projects or streams to include in your portfolio? We're primarily looking for projects that, number one, are amenable to in-situ recovery. For your audience, I, I really urge you to understand this issue because this doesn't exist in other commodities. <clears throat> in most commodities, when, when it comes to mining, mining is done by conventional mining techniques, open pit or underground mining. In uranium, 42% of global production is by way of a method called in-situ recovery. It's solution mining. It's an alternative to underground and open pit. 
75% of production growth in the last decade in uranium mining has have been in situ recovery mines. The footprint is much smaller, hence it's environmentally friendly, and the capital requirements and operating costs are much lower than conventional mining methods. So our company is an expert and a specialist in identifying, building and operating these types of mines in the United States. And we've even acquired projects that fit this protocol in South America and Paraguay. So we look for that style of deposit that can be mined with solution mining first and foremost. We do have conventional mining projects in our portfolio, but we really view them as optionality and pipeline projects for a, a, a bull market environment for uranium. But to answer your question, what are we focused on? We focused on institute recovery for the reasons I mentioned. And mm -hmm. we're really focused on permitting. You know, it takes, it takes twice as long to permit a uranium mine than a gold or copper mine. There are extra layers of regulatory requirements in uranium mining. So we really believe the competitive advantage of a company that is fully licensed to produce uranium is a high barrier to entry that will take years and years for other com companies or competitors to clear. And you can't even pay your way through that. It takes time. It takes time to build the community relations, gain the social license, and get the necessary regulatory approvals. So permitting, institute recovery, those are key requirements that we look for. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So is there ever a concern that a royalty structure could jeopardize a project's capacity to raise funds and operate? Not at all. In fact, we view this as such an integral part of seeing the development of the uranium sector is the introduction of the royalty and streaming model. The streaming and, and, and royalty model has been providing an alternative source of capital than equity and debt to the precious metal sector in such an important way that's facilitated mine development and construction over the last decade. We didn't have that in the uranium sector. There has never been a dedicated company applying the royalty model in uranium ever. And that's why we took matters into our own hands. Our company, Uranium Energy, uh, was and still is a foundational and large shareholder of Uranium Royalty Corp, uh, which is a company listed on the NASDAQ that, that we formed in 2018 with other partners in the sector to create basically the first and only publicly listed Uranium Royalty Company, making sure that the royalty structure, which is in many times a lower cost of capital to the developers and to the companies that want to build mines, Make sure we have a dedicated company in our sector that can provide that. The next 10 years, a whole new generation of uranium mines need to be built globally if we're going to meet the growing needs of uranium. The World Nuclear Association said this two weeks ago in London. They said the development of uranium mines has to double to meet demand. The doubling means more capital, more human resources. And having a sector that can have sources of capital available through equity, traditional debt, and the royalty and streaming model will only help uh, really support the funding needs of a sector that has, again, in the words of the World Nuclear Association, has to double in size when it comes to development projects over the next decade. So for investors watching, are there any significant timelines or milestones they should be watching for for Uranium Energy Corp? We have an exciting fourth quarter ahead of us, and uh, we're working on a number of projects uh, with our Reno Creek asset in Wyoming, which is fully permitted. And we're looking at uh, studies and opportunities where we can fast track the development and production of that asset. Uh, we have uh, currently a, a, an active development drilling program at our Brook Hollow project that we started in the January, uh, January of this year. Uh, it is the largest new well field initial production area of a new institute recovery project in the United States. It's exciting. It's big. We're ag aggressively advancing that project. We're the only company in the U.S. that's currently building a new uranium project that's fully permitted, and we're preparing the initial institute recovery production area. So our company has hit the ground running this year, and we've, uh, again, been building assets getting them ready for production, acquiring physical uranium, strengthening our balance sheet, looking at unlocking value at Reno Creek. Why is Reno Creek important? It's in the Powder River Basin of Wyoming. It's the largest pre-construction uranium deposit in the United States. We own that. Oh, we acquired that in the cool. bear market for uranium. 
And we see it, it's a fully permitted asset, and we see it as another important leg in our story where you are, US uranium mining, as I mentioned right now, doesn't exist. There's zero uranium mining in the US. We have permitted ability to get up to 4 million pounds per year and grow from there. And so our company truly is positioned to be a sector leader when it comes to the US uranium mining industry. And I think for any investor interested in what I described about the, the very important need to see a domestic champion be created in the uranium industry in the US, watch and follow us because we have plans to make that happen. We will be that company and there'll be many catalysts along the way. And the next three to six months uh, certainly will be uh, a big focus on making sure we demonstrate that we're on the path to uh, really lead US uranium production higher. Wow, very exciting. We'll definitely keep an eye on your company over here at The Deep Dive. Thank you so much for joining us and telling us your story today, Amir. Okay, thank you, Cassandra. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. We'll be back again with more great content tomorrow, so be sure to stay tuned by hitting that notification bell.